Um, so yeah, uh, the last speaker of the session is Mario Becca from the AWS Center for Quantum Computing in Pasadena, where it's currently 5 a.m. if I'm not mistaken. So thank you for joining us uh, so early. And I guess also from uh, Imperial College London. So uh, he's gonna talk about on a gap in the proof of the generalized quantum science lemma and its consequences for the reversibility of quantum resources. So Mario, please, the stage is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Daniel. Yeah, sorry that I, I I tried to be late. So so how long is the talk actually? Is it like twenty five minutes or something like that? Uh, yes, exactly. Twenty five minutes plus five minutes of questions. I'll let you know okay. in the chat when you have five minutes left. Uh, perfect. Yes, yes. Um, good. Yes. Um, yeah. So this is um, about this new uh, preprint uh, that we put out here. This is a second paper uh, on this slide. Uh, however, I decided to also um, mix in a little bit of this this previous work, this on composite hypothesis testing, because um, this this first work actually gives us gives us means to to prove generalized science lemma over the the, the second paper. Um, um, well, it uses other methods as well, but it also it points out some problems with um, this previous work. Anyway, let's uh, just uh, get started. Um, so the way I was thinking of, of doing this talk is to first just talk a little bit about hypothesis testing uh, in general. Um, and I think I can go through this quite fast because there's a like specialized audience here. And same thing about resource here, which is the very basics. Um, and then um, the question is, if resource series become asymptotic reversible, um, this is connected um, deeply uh, to a positive testing. So then the third point of the talk will connect uh, these, these two things. And then I think I, I won't have um, a lot of time to talk about possible uh, proof uh, techniques, but, but let's, let's see when we, when we get to it. Uh, good. Okay. So what is hypothesis testing? Quantum hypothesis testing? Uh, well, the, uh, the simplest setting is that um, we have uh, two sequences of, of states, let's say um, rho n and sigma n, and then we would like to um, discriminate uh, which uh, of the two we get. Okay, we're told we we'll get either rho n or, or sigma n, and then we want to apply this uh, two outcome PVM uh, to find out uh, which one we actually got. And of course, then we can make uh, two types of error, this type one and type two error, so we can either uh, mistakenly identify rho n as, as sigma n and or sigma n as, as rho n. And uh, of course, the, the very simplest setting here is if this like sequences of states, rho n is just a tensor product sequence, rho tensor n, and, and, and the same for sigma. And if we look at this a task, we can look at, 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 at different ways of, of minimizing this type one and, and type two errors. So the one setting is the symmetric setting where we just um, take the, the sum of the two errors or, or we weight them with one half, we want to find the measurement that minimizes this error. And then asymptotically, um, this is the so-called uh, quantum turnoff bound. Um, so uh, we can define this exponent. Um, okay, so it's easy to see that for the optimal measurement, uh, this error decays exponentially, and then we can ask with what exact exponent does it decay? And then um, there's this nice uh, closed uh, or nearly a closed uh, form solution in terms of this uh, pets or any uh, divergences here on, on, on the right hand side, right? So on the left hand side here, you have the definition, the exponent you want to quantify, and on the right hand side, you have this nice and neat characterization. So this is a, an example of a result in, in quantum hypothesis testing. Now, um, for this talk, I don't want to talk about the symmetric, but about the asymmetric um, a setting where we, we don't uh, treat the, the two errors uh, equally, um, but we have this. I uh, thought an error that we want to uh, keep uh, smaller than epsilon, then we want to see how fast the, the beta n uh, error decays. And again, it's easy to see um, that this error uh, decays exponentially, and we can ask with what exponent does it do so asymptotically, and then what comes out is the so-called quantum Stein's lemma, and we get uh, this uh, quantum uh, relative entropy as the answer here for this asymmetric setting. Uh, good. So these are very um, fundamental results uh, in in uh, quantum information theory. They're useful for for many things. Uh, now, um, what is relevant for research here is actually an extension uh, of that, which is so-called a uh, composite hypothesis testing. So here um, we're not we don't know that we're given these sequence rho n or sigma n, but we only know that we're um, 
given some rho, and then the rho tensor n version from some set T, and we're given some sigma from some set S. And then we can ask the same questions about the symmetric and asymmetric uh, quantum hypothesis testing and the asymptotic optimal error rates. So the point here is, of course, that we have to design a measurement that is good to distinguish all rows and all sigmas from each other, kind of with the same measurement simultaneously. Um, good, yeah. Um, so in this uh, in the setting where we again look at the, the tensor um, product sources, right? Um, so this uh, alpha uh, and error here, um, we now have uh, the thing that to be smaller than epsilon for every row in this set. A t and the same thing for the, for the beta and error we need to be a small uh, for every uh, sigma in the set s and, and yeah we want to find that the optimal the two outcome at p of n and uh, the thought after characterization is the same then we want to look at this um, asymptotic uh, error exponents and in particular yeah i want to work with this asymmetric setting that one could equally well look at the symmetric setting um good so now um Let's quickly look at the classical setting. And so if uh, rho and sigma, if they uh, pairwise uh, commute, which lets us go into the common eigenbasis, and so we just have the classical setting. And I'm not sure if this is the original reference, by the way. If anyone knows an earlier reference, please uh, please let me know. But what happens in, in the classical case here is, is very beautiful. Um, namely, you just get that this composite error exponent is given by the, the nth number, just yeah, the minimum over all the individual um, exponents. So you just uh, can use the relative entropy formula. So it is just the classical version of it in terms of the Kulbach-Leibler divergence um, and minimize it over the, all um, the, the inputs. Well, okay, so here it's P and Q because it's classical, so you can look at probability distribution. And, and you can see, of course, you cannot have an error smaller than that, right? Because it, it could be any, any rho or sigma that you're actually given. So, so this error exponent is kind of, you immediately get a converse from the standard hypothesis testing setting. But the point is you can actually design a measurement that also achieves um, this exponent. Now, next step of course is to ask, okay, can, can we do the same uh, quantumly or, or do things change? And uh, yeah, there have been, uh, uh, many uh, like partial results on these questions, I would say. Um, they might again be uh, missing some, some references. Please, please um, let me know. Um, but this uh, first paper that I uh, listed at the, the beginning uh, of this talk um, derives the following, uh, let's say, at least as long as the sets S and T uh, are convex and channel formula. So one can um, write this asymptotic composite error exponent in terms of this like regularized formula here. Okay, so we have the relative entropy on the right hand side. The first element is just the rho tensor n as we might expect it, but the second element is not just the sigma tensor n. I mean, if it would be just the sigma tensor n, the relative entropy is additive on the tensor product states, right? So we could simplify this formula to a, a nice classical formula we saw before, namely what we have on the, on the right hand uh, right here. Um, however, we have to look at like uh, convex uh, combinations of sigmas um, where all the sigmas are just in the set S. Uh, and as you can see, um, at least a priori, uh, this formula, this regularized formula we find here, is, is not necessarily uh, the same as this, uh, people call it single letter formula here on the right hand side that we can the classical setting. And indeed, we can construct examples so we can give like convex sets rho and sigma for which um, these two sides are not the same. So for which we really need this multi-letter um, formula. And uh, this uh, actually uh, one can see I guess the underlying technical reason why this is not true is because uh, contrary to the classical setting, we cannot lower bound um, this relative entropy distance between rho tensor n and these convex combinations as, as n times the, the, just the relative entropy distance between rho and sigma, where we minimize over, over sigma. And uh, okay, so for n equal one, this might not hold, but classically, um, this holds kind of approximately for, for large n, and then in the asymptotic limit, it holds exactly. And this is what allows this like simple and clear quantification in the classical case, but quantumly, 
yeah, when there are actually um, counter examples to this entropy inequality. Good, and I, um, okay, maybe let me make two comments here. So one is that uh, Milan, uh, he recently found that this uh, single letter, uh, these multi letter formats are also needed in the classical case as soon as we go to continuous alphabets. So if the, uh, uh, yeah, if the underlying uh, spaces are, are, are continuous, this is actually, and um, this single letter uh, quantification already is wrong classically. Um, so this is not necessarily only a, a quantum effect. But that's the first comment. The second uh, comment is that if we choose nice sets S and T, for, for the, 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 you know, the sets of rows and sigmas, then in many examples, um, we anyway have a single letter quantification. However, this is not like a, a general off the shelf result, but we have to kind of manually prove it uh, every time for, for like nice setting. Good. So this is kind of the, the landscape around um, hypothesis testing um, that I want to introduce. Are, are there any questions uh, so far? Can I ask a question, Mario? Yes, no, no, hi. Hi there. Uh, so nice means what sort of nice? Um, well, Can you give one example, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, when this is uh, nice, I think there is um, this resource theory of coherence or something like that. It then, um, so I think you fix row and then the, the optimization. In the second argument, becomes um, a single letter. Yeah, it's basically just whenever this, this entropy inequality here the, 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 at the bottom, when, when one can show something like that. Um, but I don't, this is, yeah, maybe this is my problem. Maybe this is a, uh, a general problem about this question. I don't have a good handle on like what it means like technically to be nice. I mean, in some sense, like as classical as possible, yeah. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. Okay, so then uh, let me uh, switch uh, gears um, for a second and talk very briefly about the resource series. I think and most people here probably know about this in and out and better than I do. Um, but uh, yeah, actually, let me just choose the, this resource uh, series of entanglement, even though you can make similar considerations for, for general resource series under some suitable axiom sets, okay? Um, so in the resource series of entanglement, of course, um, the free states are, are separable states. So this is just uh, the convex hull of, of product states. So we're given this like, like bipartite Hilbert space structure. Uh, and then the, the separability is with respect is cut into A and B. And then all other states that are not separable, that are not in the convex hull of product states, um, are called uh, entangled, and uh, that's what it means to be resourceful in theory. And, and then there are all these uh, like a central object in, in, in resource theory series. So actually, the resource theory of entanglement has this nice unit, the uh, uh, EBIT, okay, which is just like a uh, maximum entangled state between uh, two qubits. So this is kind of the, um, the unit, yeah, or the maximally entangled states, maximally resourceful states. Uh, and then um, we have to uh, define further things. So one is uh, like what type of, of entanglement measure uh, do we want to use? So that measures like not only if a state is resourceful or not, or, but also like how resourceful it is. Um, and what we're gonna use for most of the remainder of the talk is the so-called global uh, resource robustness. So here you, you start with the state for IP and then you ask how entangled is it? And uh, this is now measured by how much of an other state Sigma AB, you have to add um, such that the resulting state becomes separable. Okay. And then, of course, okay, it's just then um, renormalized again. Okay. So the question is how much of, of some other state you need to add such that the resulting state becomes entangled. And the more you have to add, the more entangled the state is. That's kind of the intuition of this measure. Uh, good. And then the, the last ingredient uh, of the resource theory here is um, what are the free operations? Uh, if you go from one state row to another state um, omega. And uh, of course you could choose uh, different uh, different uh, mathematical objects here. You can look at this like local operation and classical uh, communication, or you could could look at uh, positive partial transforms type of, 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 of transformations. But um, 
since we're going to be interested in, in the reversibility or the potential reversibility of, of, of the resource theory, we, it makes sense to look at, in some sense, the, the largest um, possible uh, set of operations. And these are um, the so-called uh, delta non-entangling uh, operations. So this just means you allow any quantum channel, any quantum completely positive state preserving map from some bipartite input space AB to um, bipartite out, output space A prime B prime, such that if you apply this map, you only create negligible amounts of entanglement. Okay? You do create, you do potentially create a bit delta. Um, and uh, this is, well, on the one hand, this is a mathematical uh, convenience. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you might say this is like even physically motivated because you know you never fully control what you're doing. So maybe it makes sense to allow for like tiny bits of entanglement. But this is in some sense the, the largest set of operations that make sense to consider. Um, good, and then um, we can ask um, about how much entanglement uh, can one distill. And here, okay, so this is a general formula. It's not so important. At the point, just if I start with a, with the state rho tensor n here, then the question is, if I choose, if I use this optimal delta non-entangling map, um, how much, how many e bits can I distill asymptotically? Okay, so this is the distillable entanglement. In the same way, I can I can define uh, the entanglement cost under this delta uh, non-entangling operation. So here it's just the opposite. So I start with many e bits, and then the question is, if I use the optimal map lambda, how many um, copies of row tensor n um, can I get? Okay, so this is like uh, one time I'm given the state row, I want to distill entanglement. One time I'm given um, is e bits, and the question is how many of these, what is the cost of these to make a state row? And they're always like asymptotically. Uh, or then uh, more generally, I can look at the transformation rates, right? I can ask, okay, at what rate can I go from my state row to another state sigma? Again, asymptotically, and always under this delta non entangling operation. Again, so the exact formulas here are not so important, um, but I think, yeah, just. The, the intuition of the task behind it. Okay, let's see. Um, yes, and so now the question is, is um, has this resource theory become um, asymptotically reversible? Um, so um, that means um, if I go from a state rho to a state omega, okay, at, at the uh, asymptotically optimal rate, and then I go again back to rho, do I not lose anything as, as a net cost? Or, um, I mean, resource theory entanglement has this maximally entangled state, it's EBIT. So actually the question here becomes equivalent, is the distillable entanglement the same as the entanglement cost under these delta non-entangling operations? So, so these are two equivalent uh, formulations of, of the same problem and, and yeah, uh, is that true? Okay, so now let's look quickly and on what is actually known. And about these quantities, the distillable entanglement and the entanglement cost of, of general state. And the entanglement cost actually has this um, a characterization um, in terms of this so-called smooth max relative entropy. I don't want to introduce um, uh, the formal uh, definition, um, but one way of, of, of writing, writing the entanglement cost is as this regularized relative entropy distance formula. Okay, so you look at the relative entropy between rho tensor n, and then the next state, the sigma n, where um, sigma n is in the state s, and s are the, the separable states, but of course now on, on uh, n copies. So these uh, states are separable between the a copies of n and the b copies of b. And uh, here, just as a side comment, um, this regularized formula, can it in general not be single otherwise. So again, we have to look at this like n copy um, uh, uh, limit. Good, so this is what's known about entanglement cost. Uh, now, uh, the distillable entanglement, we have a formula for the distillable entanglement, which connects resource series now um, to uh, quantum hypothesis testing. And maybe we can write it, that this asymptotic distillable entanglement, we can write it as a, as a hypothesis testing a problem and the, the composite hypothesis testing problem at that. So we look at this asymmetric error exponent and we're on um, the first argument, we have the, the row tensor n. So this is the fixed state row that we are interested in. Um, 
find the distillable entanglement on. And then uh, in the, the second argument here, the set SM, so these are again uh, the separable states. So we need to find um, a hypothesis test that distinguishes and row tensor N and all uh, separable states on, on N copies. Uh, okay. Uh, and now, uh, if we want to know if the entanglement cost and the distillable entanglement become the same, um, one way uh, of showing that would be that this hypothesis test quantity, hypothesis test problem, um, does it allow to be written, I mean, asymptotic quantification of this asymmetric error exponent, again, in terms of this regularized relative entropy formula, right? Because this is how the entanglement cost could be written. So if we could show that this entanglement permits the same formula in terms of this relative entropy distance, uh, then we would be done. Then we would know that entanglement cost and the stable entanglement are the same, and that the, the theory of the resource here of entanglement under at least this delta non entangling operations becomes asymptotically reversible. Good. Um, any, any questions um, so far about this? Um, okay. Good. Uh, uh, yeah, so so this, uh, 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 yes, Master. I think in my textbook, I already discussed this one. So in this case, uh, we should choose somehow three to uh, No, 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 no. no. Uh, at least uh, in the case of pure state case, uh, we discussed that problem. Pure states, yes. No, 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 no. In order to derive the uh, combat part, uh, this quantity is bounded by a relative entropy of entanglement. So in order to prove that argument, uh, we should use this one. So I, I discussed that method to discuss the combat. Uh, sorry, I'm not sure I understood you. You discussed that? Uh, in order to discuss the uh, combat part of the uh, uh, difference of entanglement. Yes. So in that case, uh, I, I discussed that method, I think. Okay, okay. Um, in, in, in a talk, so maybe I can look at the, oh, the, okay, okay. the video. Yeah, no, no, that would be, be good. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, so the here, okay, so here this is specifically for this, yeah, this, this delta and non-entangling operations. But okay, so yeah, so this this is the question here. Um, that, um, one might one might ask, and uh, okay, so the, to get a converse um, is is simple. So I, I don't really want to talk about it that much. But basically, one can show that this hypothesis testing um, a problem, this error exponent is is upper bounded by this relative entropy formula, and um, so this follows relatively easily. Um, but now what we found is that the achievability direction here actually um, remains open. So that, that would be the inequality um, in the other direction. Uh, and now you might say, okay, but now in the first part of my talk, I talked about this like composite hypothesis testing. Now we just have to look at this composite hypothesis testing problem here. Why don't we use the, the results from before? Um, so let's see. Um, so the row is just a fixed state here. So that that fits perfectly into the, the setting from before. However, the set of separable states here, um, is uh, unfortunately not of this form that I talked about in the first part of my talk. And the reason is even though these states are separable between all the A's and all the B's together, they might be entangled across the different A's and the different B's, okay? So that's why this is not an, an, an IAD setting. And we can just use um, some of these results I presented uh, before. Nevertheless, it might still be that, you know, we have a similar type of, of regularized relative entropy of entanglement formula that quantifies this hypothesis testing problem. Um, good. So um, I think I won't have time, much time to talk about um, um, uh, proof techniques, but, but uh, let me say uh, that a couple of things actually uh, can be shown, which maybe are not very satisfying, but, but nevertheless. Um, so if indeed um, we change the, the research theory of entanglement bit one I, and call it pseudo-entanglement theory, um, uh, such that we actually do have all this separability, not only um, between all the A's and all the B's together, but also between all the individual A's and individual B's. 
So if, if we only look at, uh, at, at those um, uh, free, uh, free uh, states, then indeed we can show that um, we get this um, regularized relative entropy of entanglement formula. But okay, we get this nice formula, uh, but the, the resource theory underlying it uh, changes, of course. Okay. And then we can play this a little further if we want. Namely, we can say, oh, okay, we can just take, you know, case of the A's together and case of the B's together, uh, and then look at, at that resulting um, resource theory. And indeed, we can also do that. Okay, so we can also um, look at, 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 at these groups of, of, of K's and then make K larger and larger. And then we actually kind of intuitively would go back to the original um, uh, entanglement uh, theory, and then we get the full, on the right hand side here, we get this full or relative entropy of entanglement formula, whereas before, okay, so I can really emphasize that, but before we had this set S bar, right? The set S bar was set of, of separable states that were also separable between all the A's and the B's. So in some sense, we had a clean resource here on the left hand side, but the wrong one, and therefore also the the wrong regularized relative entropy of entanglement formula. Whereas here in this, if we take these blocks first and let and let the size of the blocks become large, we do get the right formula on the right hand side. However, here on the left hand side, um, we we have a problem um, because we cannot just exchange these limits here. The limits in K going to infinity, epsilon to zero, and then going to infinity. We have to have them in this order. And um, because of that, we can't really connect the left-hand side to the resource area of entanglement. Okay, it's like a bit of a weird problem, but uniform convergence. But this is how it this is how it shows up if we go this approach. And and so let, let me say that yeah, this question about the achievability is a question that uh, remains open as far as I know. Mm. And uh, okay, in, in terms of uh, proof techniques, um, yeah, we need to design these universal hypothesis tests and. Uh, from how I see the literature or the landscape, there are basically three three approaches. So one goes through this like ordinary inequality and, and uses this pets running divergences. Another possible proof approach uses the so-called like measured divergences. So it's this kind of uh, relative entropy distance where you first measure and then just apply like classical measure. Or uh, the third possible approach might go through this like smooth max relative entropy where we kind of try to connect this hypothesis testing quantity with the smooth Max relative entropy. Uh, and unfortunately, um, with all of the three um, uh, approaches, uh, we run into some uh, uh, bottlenecks, uh, if, if, if you want. And, and uh, okay, I could tell you what the exact um, technical problems uh, become in each of these uh, uh, settings, but I think I'm, I'm pretty much out of time. But generally, it's always a type of like a uniform convergence question, like I had from this previous slide here, where I can't interchange limits. I have to take the limits in a certain order, but I would, you know, like them have in a different order, and this is this is where it kind of gets stuck. Um, yes, I can share my slides also afterwards, but I think I might just straight jump to the conclusions now. And yeah, sorry, this was slides from a long talk. Um, let's just take a second to get there. I mean, yeah. It's really one always gets kind of in the same problem. Uh, yeah, let me maybe just uh, say here also, I think there are uh, quite a few other similar open problems in the literature uh, that have a, a, a very similar flavor in terms of what the, 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 the technical um, bottleneck is uh, at the moment. So I think if one could, show, could solve one of these problems and um, one could also uh, show um, all the others, but okay, it's just some technical uh, intuition. Um, yeah, conclusion here, yes. So again, um, as far as I know, this is uh, entanglement and entanglement costs under this delta non-entangling operations. We do not know if, if they're the same. However, one way one could show this, uh, it's actually even only if way, is if this hypothesis testing um, a quantity can be quantified as this re the regularized relative entropy of entanglement distance. A um, couple of comments again. I think we have to be careful because this is a, a non-IID problem. So even if we go to like classical settings, now a non-IID problem, 
it's not not immediately clear if we have such a um, um, relative entropy formula. Um, and then, of course, um, for certain resource series, again, this resource series of coherence comes to mind, and one can show um, this, uh, this conjecture, uh, if you want. Um, yeah. But one basically has to show this manually every time. So, so, so far, so for some nice resource series, this works, but, but in general, like for the resource series entanglement, I don't think we know. And also, let me say that in every case, that we do know that this conjecture holds, the right-hand side becomes single letter. So I'm not aware of any setting where the right-hand side stays multi-letter like here necessarily, um, but we, we can resolve this conjecture. And um, so my, my guess actually is that this reversibility does, does not hold uh, in general. And there has been this, this recent work by um, Ludovico and uh, Bartosz. And I, I should probably, um, uh, stop here, um, but basically uh, what their work shows is that if you um, replace this um, global resource robustness as the entanglement measure uh, with a different entanglement measure, just the resource robustness, so this R bar, and the difference here is just that you don't ask how much of another state sigma you have to add, such that the state becomes separable. Here you ask how much of another separable state you have to add, okay, such that the resulting state becomes separate. So if you use this slightly different entanglement measure, so you um, and, and correspondingly the set of, of, of free operations, and then one can actually show that the corresponding resource here of entanglement becomes not reversible. So this conjecture about the, the state of entanglement is, um, is wrong. So in some sense, I think if, if, if the theory would be nice, this shouldn't, this theory shouldn't depend on the exact choice of your entanglement measure, but it seems that it does. So even if reversibility holds, it will only hold for like some very specific entanglement measure. Um, so that might not be super satisfying, but yeah, this is what, this is what stays open. Okay, so let me go back maybe. Yeah, this is the question. Okay, thanks. I'm gonna finish here. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, so uh, Daniel was uh, a chair of this session, but unfortunately he has to leave <laughs> because at that time uh, he he uh, took a and uh, of session on this session in airport. So maybe he has to catch his flight. So then he already left. So uh, instead of him, so I have to take a uh, lot of session here and. Okay. Sorry, my, my previous comment is somehow uh, misleading, so I uh, completely misunderstand, so please ignore. So is there any okay. comment or uh, question? Uh, question or comment? So I understand, so, okay, so what is the problem? So previously, uh, EDANA equal to ETANA. So uh, that uh, Premier and uh, uh, Fernando's paper uh, discussed that point. But uh, now you find that gap because in order to prove that equality, you need to prove uh, this convergence. But uh, that convergence is still open. So uh, now, now I could understand. So. Uh, and really, this is not a trivia. Uh, yes, so sorry, yeah, yeah, exactly. So if I, I, I jump to this slide 50 that I didn't show before, okay, there's a lot of formulas on here. Um, but basically, if you look at the last line here, so what they, they claimed is that this, this information variance between uh, rho tensor n and this sigma n, that this would decay exponentially or like nearly exponentially. Um, but this is in their analysis, basically what, what what went wrong and uh yeah but i don't know how fast this i mean that would be one way of of, of tackling this uniform and conversion also, uh, the, the difficulty of this topic is uh, uh following now you are that original problem is not exact distillation not exact uh, for, uh entanglement cost uh, this is approximate uh, a kind of approximate of the uh, entanglement distillation and approximate of the entanglement cost. No, not uh, this is different from usual cost and distillation rate. Uh, 
so, so here it was this delta non-entangling operations, yes. And so could, could you back to the, uh, that definition? So yes. You know, not not yes. hypothetical testing, original problem. So original. Uh, Yes, sorry, I have to find yeah, this yeah, so, so now, now, yo, okay, okay. Now, next, yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's the impression of bad. Yes, yes, yes. In the, eh? uh, wait, no, uh, one more, one more. Um, I think I just want uh, here. So these are, is that what you're referring to? These delta non entangling operations here? Ah, uh, yes. So you just, uh, you, 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 Maybe next one, next one is better, I think, because okay. you, uh, E, E, ah, yes, E, N, E, yes, this one, so E, E, D, A, N, E, and E, C, A, N, E, so not E, D, and not E, C, so what is the difference, because you are delta N, delta yes, there's, N. there's, there's delta a finite N, that if delta n equal to exact zero, so in that case, this one becomes this so if, cost. Yes, if delta n is zero, just for every n, then we know that the entanglement cost and the still entanglement are not the same. Yes, so, so usually uh, in, in, in the case of cost and distillation, uh, we consider the case with delta n exactly equal to zero. But now you relax that condition, then you de define this quantity. This one is A N E. What is the meaning of A N E? A N E is a simple. I guess maybe known. almost non-entangling. So, so let me also say that like Brandao and Plenio did all of that, right? Like just like that's was their idea was to allow for this delta n to be non-zero for every n, and then they thought they could show that under this relaxation entanglement cost and the same thing was the same they, they enlarged the set of operations because then they thought they could show that a the theory comes entanglement operation a simple no entanglement operation so this is somehow a uh, reaction of the uh our operation the realization of the our operation so then uh fernando and uh, martin uh, consider that uh, if we, we uh, relax that uh, condition for our operation, these two quantities may be same. But to prove this one, and they assume that one. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, uh, please, uh, Niradera. So, yeah, just a question, uh, somewhat uh, oblique question. So, uh, you see, uh, with this uh, non entangling operations, yeah? So, these we know um are physically less meaningful in the entanglement case than the LOCC operations right because like a swap it is uh, this mm -hmm. is a non-local operation so my question is to do with general resource theories so in resource theories you would replace this asymptotically non-entangling operations if I understand correctly by asymptotically non-resource generating operations right yes yeah, and so uh, do you have this scenario there too? That these uh, these are these um, uh, for physical operations, or are they like this NE operations or delta NE operations that they're mathematically well defined, but could be quite um, uh, re removed from what one could physically physically do in that resource theory? Uh, yes, I mean in this original framework of Branda and Plenio, that that was the case. They would just show this in this kind of like black box way they would say you have a general resource series you define this like a general non or delta non resource generating maps and then you could then you could show the the, the reversibility however if you look at um, specific resource series then it might be that you can actually already get these reversibilities between distillable distillability and, and cost uh, for operations that are actually physical right like here it's just proven like in this general way that you need to use these most general operations um but if you have a nice resource theory it might be that you know it already becomes reversible under actually like physical operations i mean it depends on your resource theory but then you have to kind of prove it by hand every time you can't use this well, black box result i mean anyway the black box result turned out to be not not complete yeah. so you can't use it anyway but i mean so basically the setting is just like we, we we know for by now that for composite quantum hypothesis testing or even for classically composite 
hypothesis testing, we have to be careful and we have to kind of like look at the problem one by one. There's not like a general nice solution. And I think it's going to be the same as with the re reversibility of resource series. It depends on the exact structure of the like free states and so on and so forth. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Okay, uh, is there any other comment or question? Okay, uh, now we want to close this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Masaita. Thanks a lot. Uh, can I just say something on yes. behalf uh, of uh, everybody uh, attending Beyond the ID? I, um, I would like to thank Masahito and all the other organizers for. for um, organizing this nice Beyond the ID meet and uh, keeping this tradition going. Thank you very much, Masahito. Oh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yes, definitely. So, uh, yes, in this uh, Beyond the ID, there is uh, two uh, organizing committee. One is by two you, he is a uh, postdoc of uh, South Cape. Another guy is Don Yan, he is a researcher of. Uh, 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 quantum issues in Tuskegee, so uh, they will take uh, some uh, role of the uh, organizing committee. So thank you very much. So uh, we we will have a uh, uh, session chair and uh, no matter no 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 business meeting. So business meeting will start from uh, uh, twenty minutes later. So we have uh, twenty minutes break. Later we have uh, that discussion. Uh, so thank you very much.